Uh, so yes, thank you so much for the introduction and the opportunity to join this pretty fantastic group. I am really excited to hear the discussion after this didactic. So uh, I am Crystal Walker. I'm a doctorally trained PA and I'm currently the director of substance use disorders clinical services with My Health, My Resources of Tarrant County in Fort Worth, Texas. So I am the director of a very multifaceted substance use center. We have a residential detox. We have an intensive residential counseling rehab program, an ambulatory detox, an intensive outpatient, a supportive outpatient, and an outpatient-based opiate treatment program. Lots of different programs under my purview and my bread and butter for the last eight years has been treating substance use disorders. Uh, so I have no disclosures and I do want to put out that the views and opinions are mine and not that of necessarily my company, MHMR of Tarrant County. So I do want to take a little journey through my experiences and why I am so drawn to this topic, even though I definitely don't consider myself an expert in this topic, but Starting back when I was in school, right, during my rotations, I would have encounters where I were, I was taught things like, oh, the cervix doesn't have very many nerve endings, or they shouldn't really be feeling that. So I took this in, like, okay, all right, maybe this is true. This is what my preceptor is telling me. And then one day I witnessed a IUD insertion and it looked unbelievably painful and gruesome. And this was earlier in the 2000s. And this individual was Nola Paris. She hadn't had given birth to any children. And the preceptor was telling me, oh yeah, that we typically don't do this in Nola Paris women because it is more uncomfortable for them. And this woman during this procedure had just been told to take some ibuprofen or Tylenol beforehand, and nothing else was utilized during the seizure as far as local anesthesia uh, in order to insert this IUD. And she turned white as a ghost, became completely diaphoretic, was obviously in significant discomfort. And I just took it in as this is part of this. This is how it happens. We encourage individuals who are nola paris not to get this but it's their choice and we warn them about the pain beforehand then my first job i work at the tarrant county jail i'm a primary care provider for the first seven years of my career inside of a jail it was baptism by fire i received so much information early on in my career that it was an incredibly fantastic way to start but I also would hear these small bits and pieces like, oh man, I do not want to work on the women's pod today. They are all hormonal. Or why do you want to work at Carswell? It's a prison with all females. I could never, ever work there. Like they just have way too many complaints. They're too extra. I also learned of a term that was used quite often called status Hispanicus, where an individual, typically female, Hispanic, complaining of something was dismissed by saying, oh, she just has status Hispanicus. Then I get to where I am now, treatment of suds. And I've heard things like a woman expressing difficulty with affording her medication. And she would be told things like, oh, well, you could afford the heroin every day. Why can't you afford this medication or treatment? Like, this is better for you. Find the way to pay for it. And this individual was indigent and was likely using sex work to pay for her substance use prior, and she wants to get out of that. Um, other things like, oh, she's just manipulating the system. One I heard a lot was, she must be borderline. So after a couple years, over a decade in medicine, I, I was just baffled at some of the ways that we look at and we treat women in this large medical complex. So I wanted to know why, why are women discredited? Why are they undeserving of trust or belief and their confidence is destroyed? Well, let's talk about hysteria. So definition of hysteria, a psychogenic issue. It comes from the Greek word 
for womb. Hysteria was peculiar to women and caused by disturbances of the uterus. The first known use of the word hysteria as a diagnostic tool was in the 1700s. So early in the 1700s, a Dr. Joseph Rollin, a male, described hysteria as a vaporous ailment. And I wonder if this is where the term she has the vapors came from. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm in my imagination and that's where this came from. Oh, she just has the vapors. Uh, but then we get a more in-depth description from a French doctor in the 1770s. And he expanded on hysteria and said, oh, Hysteria in women can include all of these things, a swollen abdomen, chest pain, shortness of breath, difficulty swallowing, cold extremities, tears, laughter, yawning, delirium, close and driving pulse, and abundant and clear urine. Wow. So in the 1700s, anything that was bothering a woman was labeled as hysteria. Oh, she just has hysteria. I took a trip to New Orleans back in October and I went to the pharmacy museum. The picture on this slide is from that pharmacy museum. And I was just flabbergasted. So I'll read a quote from the middle of it. When I see a neurotic woman with a nasal mucosal membrane, which is tolerably healthy, and yet she complains persistently, ah, Bring it to my especial notice. I always think it's a case of hysteria. Okay. All right. Thank you for that <laughs> diagnosis uh, from an ear, nose, and throat specialist in the late 1800s, 1899. Hysteria of the nose and throat. So everything was put into this basket that all of these symptoms that were listed were caused by a woman's uterus. Everything from the uterus. This is caused by hysteria. So in the 19th century, Dr. Richard Buke decided, oh, you know what would cure hysteria? Let's remove their uteruses. So any woman presenting with these conditions or ailments or complaints may have gotten their uterus taken out to try and cure them. That or the myriad of other treatment options that looked incredibly appealing, like pelvic massage, leeches to the abdomen to reduce blood flow to the womb. Oh, you know what you need? You need marriage. That will treat everything. What is absolutely astounding to me is the fact that hysteria was in the DSM-2 and was not dropped out of the DSM-2 until the 1980s. So in 1980, we finally got rid of the diagnosis of hysteria. But did we? So female hysteria was once very common and it applied to everything. Okay. If she's acting inappropriately, if she has too many emotions that just can't be handled by men, anxiety, anger, or even sexual desire. Oh, she has hysteria, but we got rid of that, right? However, the uterus is still being used to discredit women. Just think about it. How often have we ourselves said, oh, it's just because I'm on my period. I'm emotional because I'm just hormonal. Or yeah, I know I'm a little angry, but I, I think I might be starting my period soon. Or, oh, this is, these menopausal symptoms have me crazy. We do it to ourselves as well as the rest of the public doing it to us. And so sometimes this is really subtle. Sometimes it can be unconscious. So I'll give you an example. A triage nurse may be treating a woman who's coming in complaining of some chest pain, but her vitals look okay. Preliminary EKG may look okay. So she's like, oh, she looks really anxious. This might just be anxiety. And she's discredited that, oh, this is just related to her emotions. So what about discounted? How are women in the medical realm discounted, considered unworthy of consideration? Well, let's go back to the Greeks again. You know, they came up with the wonderful hysteria diagnosis. Guess what else they did? They said the default human body is the male body. And 
Aristotle even went as far to say, yeah, women's bodies are just mutilated male bodies. And for a long time, they truly believed that ovaries were just female testicles that were in the wrong place and didn't recognize them as a separate organ for many, many years. So the baseline for hundreds of years has been the male body. But surely we've grown past that, right? Oh, unfortunately, gender representation is abysmally skewed, even in modern research. So if we look at around 1985 to 1993, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, recognized, oh, you know what, we do lack some gender representation in a lot of our studies that we're using. So let's do something about that. Let's put out a report saying it's lacking. So they put out a report and not much else happened. Then they got audited and they're like, hey, you know this report you put out? You haven't done anything about it. How about you do something about it? So almost 10 years later, around you know early 1990s, they developed the Office of Research on Women's Health. And this office department implemented some real tangible things. They mandated the inclusion of women as research subjects. They launched the Women's Health Initiative. They had a huge medical research study to collect the data on women that was already available to men. They also mandated that NIH funded studies include enough women and racial minorities to conduct a valid analysis of differences and also increase the efforts to research conditions that disproportionately affect women. So how did we go from there? Things went okay. We got our first gender specific medical textbook that was published in 2004, got some improvement there. But then in 2014, so pretty recent, 2014, they realized that the changes weren't sufficient. And the reason why is because this was only applicable and mandated to NIH funded studies that involved human trials. So all of the cellular level studies, all of the animal research phases were all still male. So we are again leaving out valid, important information when it comes to research on diseases and it's disproportionately affecting the women. Addition to that, two other huge areas that conduct biomedical research, the FDA and pharmaceutical companies, not part of this mandate. So they can still exclude women from their research. And the reasons that are often given is, oh, we're protecting women, especially women of childbearing age, because we don't know if this medication is going to affect a fetus. We don't want women who could possibly get pregnant to be involved. So we're just going to exclude women or women of childbearing age. And so let's look at this from the aspect of heart disease. Take the baby aspirin study. This is a very famous study. We all know the after effects of it because we recommend to our patients to take a baby aspirin. Even if you're not in medicine, you probably know to take a baby aspirin because of its preventative effects on heart disease. But guess what? Women weren't a part of that study at all. They were completely excluded. In 2022, there was a literature review conducted on the topic of heart failure. And what that lit review found is out of 59 randomized control trials, women only consisted of 21% of the overall participation. Four of the studies completely excluded women outright. Eight excluded women of childbearing age. And the study revealed that there's been a little improvement over the last three decades of representing women in these studies. Um, and this is case in point. I'll give you a brief case study. So a 50-year-old female attorney was worried because she had noticed chest press pressure and trouble maintaining endurance during regular exercise. So she went to her gynecologist and her internist, and both of them said, you know what, you don't need to worry. This is just a combination of you being perimenopausal and also the stress of your high-powered job because you're a female attorney. That's very stressful. But she knew something else was wrong. And so she continued to pursue it and continued to push forward because she knew she shouldn't be getting winded walking up a flight of stairs. So she was finally given a stress test and a workup that concluded that she had coronary artery calcium or coronary artery disease. 
and hypertension, and her symptoms weren't simply due to hormones and anxiety. So what can we do about this, right? We tried to, on a uh, institution level, to implement the major research bodies to include us. We are trying to get rid of diagnoses that are harmful. So what if we took a legal path? What if we start having some medical malpractice lawsuits that will push the medical community to change? Well, here's the issue with that. Medical malpractice only requires that practitioners abide by what ordinary practitioners in their field would do in similar situations. So discounting and discrediting women and their complaints is so rampant that it is what ordinary practitioners would do in their own field. So rising to the level of medical malpractice is incredibly difficult, especially in states like Texas. Um, and there was a quote from a wonderful study called Miss MISS Diagnosed regarding the gender gap in medical malpractice lawsuits that stated the combination of the knowledge gap that the medical community lacks the medical community's lack of knowledge about women's health due to women's historical underrepresentation in medical research, and then the trust gap, the medical profession's history of distrusting and downplaying women's reports of their own symptoms creates an increased risk of missed, delayed, or incorrect diagnoses for women. So let's look at trust. Why are women not trusted? Well, a lot of this comes back to misconceptions. So if you look at the Kinsey report, this is where when I was in the earlier 2000s heard the cervix doesn't have any nerve endings and this shouldn't hurt, but then at the same time was told nulliparous women shouldn't get an IUD because it hurts too much. I know things have changed a little bit, but that was definitely concerning to me as a student. A lot of this stemmed from this Kinsey report where he published all of the clinical and experimental data show that the surface of the cervix is most completely insensitive part of the female genital anatomy. And in his own research, he published that only 5% of 878 women reported they could feel a gentle stroking on their cervix. But what's ironic is that he completely ignored his own conflicting data that when it was distinct pressure, 84% of the same women could feel that. So he ignored it and decided, you know what, they wrote, nah, they can't feel anything. So when women state, I feel everything you're doing during my pap smear, I can feel every brush stroke, I can feel everything you're doing, and they're dismissed with, oh, it's just a pinch, it'll be over soon, it's, it's just a little pinch, no big deal. So what are the consequences of this? One story that I heard about that really was quite disturbing to me was regarding a Yale Reproductive and in Endocrinology and Infertility Clinic where they were treating women and doing egg retrievals for infertility. And during this egg retrieval process, they would be given the max amount of fentanyl and Versed. And they couldn't be given any more, yet they were screaming and crying and diaphoretic and pale and obviously in pain, stating they could feel every, every single egg being ripped from their body. And yet, even when a physician came in and said, hey, you didn't just give me fentanyl, you gave me saline. I can taste it in my mouth. That was saline. They continued to say, no, it was fentanyl. We definitely gave you fentanyl. That's not what's happening. You've had the max amount of fentanyl. You shouldn't be feeling this and dismissed it. This went on for five months until a male anesthesiologist noticed the cap of a fentanyl bottle was not on properly. And they finally discovered that for five months, a nurse had been diverting all of the fentanyl and replacing it with saline. Yet every woman, Many of them who went through this procedure and said this is incredibly painful were ignored, dismissed, and discounted. There is now a lawsuit. 68 of those women are suing Yale for their part in this issue. So it's sometimes more than a pinch. It hurts, and it's not all in our head. Yet you can get countless stories of women stating that 
it took 10 years to get diagnosed with lupus, that it took five years of complaining of weight gain and lethargy and generalized abdominal pain to get finally diagnosed and end up having stage four squamous melanoma of the bladder. So what can we do about this? There's a, we're fighting hundreds of years of history of being discounted, distrusted, and discredited. So some of the things that we need to do is develop gendered medical education curriculums, shed light on the gender bias in existing treatment protocols. How many people knew or know that the famous baby aspirin study didn't include women? Um, and treat women with integrated teams. Make sure everyone that could possibly be involved that the ob -GYN doesn't discount the chest pain, that she gets a cardiologist involved on her own and helps advocate for her patients. Um, also increase trial funding. So the NIH is mandated, but nobody else is. So let's give them an incentive for women to participate. Also, let's get women on trial leadership. And then always, if you're going to a medical appointment or you know a female going to a medical appointment, go with them or have an advocate or a friend or a family member to go to these appointments and try to advocate for them. These are my references. Thank you.